Well, welcome to Christ and Culture. My name is Pastor Jeff Short, and today we're going to be reviewing a lecture that was given last summer at the Chautauqua Institution in New York State, and it was given by an associate editor of Christianity Today. Christianity Today is the number one evangelical magazine. It's been around for back in the late 50s, early 60s. It began, I think, in 1959 and has served as the leading magazine for evangelicals. And here is one of the editors of Christianity Today, a young woman named Caitlin Beatty, or Beatty, and she's going to give some pretty curious reactions to the political landscape that we find ourselves in, especially in connection with Donald Trump. It seems that she's going to take the approach that Donald Trump is a disaster and totally ignore the alternative of, of a Hillary Clinton win, how that would have been a disaster, no mention of that. So I'm going to analyze this uh, speech that she gave and really try to make sense of it. So let's uh, listen in on that speech as she's introduced. Speaker Caitlin Beatty served as the youngest and first female managing editor managing of Christianity editor. Today. She began with the magazine as a copy editor and has served as an associate editor, the co-creator of a woman's website, so she's been with so Christianity Today for there quite a while, um, as that magazine has figure out where I was. gone she off began the rails with the magazine as respects. a copy editor and has since served as an associate editor, the co-creator of a women's website, Hermeneutics, the editorial director for Christianity Today's blog. I mean, I'm this not the only one that believes that Christianity Today has large. wandered from its uh, evangelical book, roots. A, woman's uh, a lot of uh, scholars have pointed out that uh, if you compare Christianity, Christianity Today today office, compared with home, when it's founded, ministry, and beyond. it's a vastly different it magazine. Post, it has departed Atlantic, from New York Times, the emphasis on evangelical culture. priorities. Um, and has drifted into the more social justice uh, liberal direction. Calvin College and also studied theology at Oxford University. She is accompanied by her mother Karen on this, her first visit to Chautauqua, and her lecture is titled The Evangelical Crisis. The Crisis, Please she join feels, me in is the Caitlin election Beatty of Donald Trump. This morning not the moral slide that we've observed. Thank you for such a warm welcome, Jeff. My mom and I, uh, this is our first time at Chautauqua, and as we were listening to the church bells ringing yesterday morning, my mom said, oh, this is just a little slice of what heaven will be like. And I said, yeah, maybe heaven will be a little bit more diverse. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't but characterize this... Chautauqua as a slice of heaven. Um, but it is a beautiful grounds, and they keep up but the landscaping. But this is definitely a slice and that you have. It is a, so thank a very you strange for your warmth and, hospitality and quirky word. kind of Delighted a retreat center. Here. The night last October, uh, election night, I will admit that I got very little sleep. They say that wine interferes with sleep patterns, so surely the Cabernet that I sipped while watching a wave of red sweep from east to west across the televised electoral so map didn't with help with a blue wave. That would have been better. I, but that night, I managed to have one dream. I don't... In it, I'm standing on a stage in an auditorium full of Christian leaders, and I am telling them that their support for Trump during the 2016 election will prove And that they should have state. supported Hillary Clinton? Is that the alternative? The next I... morning greeted me as it did half the voting wow. population with some grief and confusion. 
But the days following that morning brought a more complex emotion. I have come to think of it as something like soul abandonment. Analysis oh my goodness, from she's the taking the entire liberal progressive um, of overreaction to the elections. White voting evangelical Christians and from a Christian perspective, that doesn't Trump. make any sense. A man who has said that he never asked God right. for forgiveness. That's right, that is a problem. Their support for Trump was actually higher than their support for previous presidential candidates, such as I mean, I've done Mitt videos Romney on why Trump was not the best candidate among all of the primary candidates. The warnings but about once Trump he won from some the primary, evangelical leaders and you have two options, either Trump or Hillary Clinton. Today, had seemed it's to fall on wanted, many but that's what deaf we ears. And in the days after the election, I felt that I no longer recognized my because own Because they didn't family. vote for Hillary? But I can no more disown that family than I can disown Hillary? my biological Pro -gay family. Pro-gay marriage Hillary? And sometimes the bonds of Culture faith of death, run Hillary? deeper it, than blood. This is odd. Now, you can all breathe a sigh of relief. The Chautauqua Institution did not invite me to its renowned speaker series to have me process my spiritual angst in front of hundreds of strangers. And surely people of faith have survived far worse than a Trump it presidency. It would have been a lot worse with the Hillary that. Clinton presidency. Isn't it strange that these kinds of people don't ever say that? I'm not that. sure that you all agree with they that. They don't recognize reality. They don't look at what the alternative would but have been. But it's important to mind say, the wow, we really dodged of evangelicals' broad one. support for such a decidedly unevangelical candidate. Today, evangelicals compose 25% of the United States population. And they have and will continue to have an influence on our common life. I believe that the 81% signals that evangelicalism this is kind of strange. She's as talking a about movement they, evangelicals, has drifted far from not its roots. we, evangelicals. And finds itself Very in the strange. midst of two crises. Kind of crises. like saying those people. The first crisis if she's is one, one of us, authority, she wouldn't say those. And is at they, the heart of the movement. And I will trace that history momentarily. And the second crisis is one of identity. And it flows from the crisis of authority, but has taken on new urgency in the past 50 years in the midst of much cultural change and upheaval in the West. So this morning, I will trace those two crises. Before suggesting now, what is really typical of this kind of approach, and I've seen this before and I will with do so as some of the other um, observers the evangelical movement. of evangelicalism, I am inside and the movement we saw this with Colin Hansen when he gave his interview life, a couple months ago to ABC News. And what he did was he basically term. said, um, evangelical I attend uh, Christianity may never recover and for their support for Donald church, Trump. People raise their hands. And on and on and on about how bad Donald Trump is and how he's not a good candidate and how he's not a good president and how it was a disaster that we aligned ourselves with Donald Trump. And like Caitlin Beatty here, he totally ignores God. the reality of the alternative. To live in such the a reality of the alternative is this. If we had mercy, not voted for Donald for Trump, whom I believe bear we would now have Hillary Clinton, pro-abortion, pro-death, pro-gay marriage, pro-LGBT, Pro, just you just go on down Even the list. She I stands basically opposed to the entire moral we'll agenda of Christianity. If it appears to be going and down. yet, people like Colin Hansen, Kathleen, Caitlin Biddy, Beatty, continue to beat this drumbeat that says, "Oh, I'm so sad that Trump was my was elected. I'm so sad that evangelicals and given, aligned and supported the, the for him." You need to wake up, people, and realize for the that 
people didn't vote for Donald Trump because they liked him. They voted for Donald Trump because they didn't like Hillary Clinton. Brokenness. But I also speak today as somewhat of an outsider insofar as the evangelical label has become a political rather than a theological label. You've probably heard this. And that's this partly because the secular times. press doesn't understand Some of religion my without politics. They can't of the look at things right as spiritual. They have to have a political to stem the or economic of reason for everything. By forming alliances with political leaders. And even though the original architects of the religious right are now either dead or defamed, their legacy looms large in the assumption that Christian witness necessarily looks like voting for one political party over the other. And alongside many other millennial Christians, I lament the ways this alliance has led evangelicals to look and sound like a voting block and to overlook pressing issues that are not core to the Republican Party agenda. So today, if someone asks, are you an evangelical, I have to ask the follow-up question. Well, what does that word mean to you? That's a good question. It's worth spending a bit of time tracing the historical roots of evangelicalism in the U.S. I have found that of all the religious groups in this country, evangelicals are among the most misunderstood. Even top-notch publications like The New Yorker and The New York Times frequently get evangelicals wrong referring to them as evangelists. I've seen that. Or the evangelicals, which is to miss the movement's decentralized nature and its diversity on the ground. It's well established that religion is somewhat of a blind spot for many journalists. Exactly. Who are prone to fill in the facts because of their secular with stereotype worldview. and hast hastily scanned Wikipedia entries. This leads to some errors that are by turns hilarious and grating. For example, one New York Times report on tourism to Israel noted that the Church of the Holy Sepulcher marks the site where, quote, many Christians believe that Jesus' body is buried. <laughs> If that many Christians really believe that Jesus' bo body is dead and buried in the ground, that story should have been on the front page. <laughs> Since all Christians affirm that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Last fall, in an interview with NPR's Terry Gross, the New York Times executive editor, Dean Backett, admitted that, quote, the New York-based and Washington-based media powerhouses don't quite get religion. I we remember don't get PBS the of reported that on Easter lives. Sunday is and the I belief that Jesus Christ um, went to heaven. I believe journalists have a particularly on Easter hard Sunday. time getting evangelicals. <laughs> Not that he rose bodily from the dead, but he went. His soul went sure to heaven. Who they are and who totally misunderstanding them. the resurrection. The movement is democratic, drawing from hundreds of denominations, each with its distinct emphases and traditions and figureheads. And it is also a global movement that includes believers as diverse as Chinese house churches and mega churches in Nigeria that draw 200,000 It is a very diverse movement. There's no question week. about that. This makes the but movement there is a core incredibly diverse, moral and doctrinal But its democratic uh, spirit has its pitfalls. When a reporter wants to know what Catholics think of a particular bill in the Senate, he or she knows what to search online or who to call, a local archbishop or to look up a statement mm, from well, the U.S. With Conference Pope Francis, of Catholic Bishops. And not so much. By contrast... We evangelicals don't have a pope. We have a and Bible. By the way, many days I think we could stand to have one. 
in the vacuum of centralized leadership, often the loudest voices espousing the most extreme views end up speaking for the whole family. So what is an evangelical? What do we make of the fact that there are Catholics who call themselves evangelical? Does the evangelical family include the snake handlers and faith healers tucked away in the Appalachian Mountains? And what about the folks who tick evangelical on national polls and surveys who have not been inside a church in over a decade? To understand how the movement has drifted far from its roots, we, we must examine those roots. What about so-called pro-abortion evangelicals? Once quipped that what an about pro-gay evangelicals? Who likes Billy Graham. Those are contradictions. <laughs> and I like Billy Graham. What about pro-Hillary Clinton evangelicals? Crusades which is of a contradiction. Which is a contradiction. Found their forebears in revivals that swept across the North Atlantic Anglo-American world in the 18th and 19th centuries. These revivals were led by men such as the uh, itinerant evangelist George Whitfield, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, and the Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards. I would go further back and to the Reformation. To you have to really start talking about John Calvin, Martin Luther. These revivals, often drawing crowds of thousands, called individuals to repent to turn away from sin and toward Christ and to rely on him for salvation. By faith These alone. These revivalists stress that faith came not from simply going to church or for, from following church rituals, but rather from an intensely personal experience of having one's heart strangely warmed, in the language of the Wesleys, by the good news. The word evangelical derives from the Greek evangelion, which means good news or gospel. And what is the good news to the Christian? It is that in Christ, God has conquered sin and death through the cross and offers salvation and new life through the Holy Spirit to all who believe and trust in Jesus. By faith As alone such, is the evangelical, evangelical movement cry. centers on conversion, which is understood as both a single moment and a lifelong process of trusting Christ and his promise of salvation. Now, these revivals of the first and great second awakenings were so successful but by, that by the beginning of the 19th century, evangelicalism was the dominant expression of Christianity in the United States. That's true. And the Methodist and Baptist churches had gone from obscure sects to America's two largest denominations. It's worth noting that evangelicalism has always carried with it a call for social and not just personal change. But as a secondary, One popular definition a primary. of the movement comes from David Bebbington. According to the British historian, the, full, the four hallmarks of evangelical faith are as follows. First, conversionism, the belief that one needs to change to be converted as a result of the gospel. Second, biblicism, the belief that the Bible is the word of God. The Bible and is the has infallible, inerrant word of God, yes. Third, crucicentrism. <laughs> The belief that the death of Christ on the cross is the defining moment of history. Atoning sacrifice. Yes. And finally, activism. The belief that the gospel compels us to work toward social reform during our time on earth. I would say holiness now, that goes into part of communal holiness has when enough people are transformed. Of mass evangelism, perhaps most famously in the figure of Billy Graham and his televised crusades. The impulse among evangelicals to evangelize, to share the good news, is perhaps their most curious 
and even most despised trait in a pluralistic society. For how can anyone claim to have a corner on the truth about God, a truth that presumes to be not simply the truth for me, but the truth for all well, people. Well, in a postmodern world, it's hard it's because no of the relativity of, of truth. It's no wonder a lot of being caught on an airplane next to an evangelical. Myself the millennial included. generation is relativistic, doesn't believe but in absolute truth. That That's this the activism problem today. has actually been the animating force behind great social good in the United States. The evangelical movement holds that the good news of the gospel isn't just for individual people, but it's for the flourishing of whole communities and societies. As a byproduct, though. And this is where evangelicals diverge from their long-lost cousins, the fundamentalists, who are remembered for their rejection of modern forms of uh, intellectual inquiry and their role in the Scopes Monkey Trial in the 1920s. The battle with liberalism. When evangelicalism emerged as Unfortunately, a Unfortunately, she's in the crowd II, of a hotbed of liberalism, movement. so she has to be its very careful, I guess. She can't really say that. The fundamentalists for neglecting pressing social issues and for retreating from cultural engagement. These evangelicals underscored that if the good news isn't good for my neighbor, my fellow image bearer, and doesn't compel me to act on their behalf, then it's not really good news. Mm, that's a little confusion Perhaps of the social no gospel. Perhaps other evangelical captured this better than the 19th century preacher Charles Finney, the most important figure of the Second Great Awakening. Finney spent his childhood not far from where we are today in Henderson, New York, which is about four hours of north of here. When Finney was 29, he came to Christ with signature evangelical drama, kneeling in prayer during a walk in the woods. He later said that it was like waves of liquid love coursing through his body. The next morning after this walk in the woods, Finney dropped out of law school and began a period of study with the Presbyterian Church. And he spent the next 15 years traveling throughout upstate New York, drawing thousands of cr in crowds, facing opposition from conservative Presbyterians and liberal Unitarians alike. His preaching included warnings against the social problems that came from alcohol abuse, calls for the humane treatment of prisoners, support for women's rights, and most important for his time, admonitions against the sin of slavery. Now this was an era in our nation's history when being called an abolitionist was an insult in the North and might get you killed in the South. But Finney believed that Christian conversion always resulted in a changed life and that slaveholders risked judgment for keeping their fellow image bearers in bondage. During Finney's tenure at Oberlin College, first as a, a, a professor, excuse me, and later as its president, Oberlin became the first U.S. college to admit both African Americans and women and became an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Unfortunately, today, Oberlin has gone liberal, uh, was watered down Christianity. It's a shame. And went on to organize the 70. It was a group of abolitionists sent out, like Jesus' disciples, to preach freedom for slaves. Even as the abolitionist movement splintered and lost funding, and even while many Christians proudly defended slavery, Finney and his friends left a long legacy of evangelical social responsibility. We see it in organi organizations today like International Justice Mission, 
which rescues victims of slavery and sex trafficking worldwide. And there's Compassion International. And World Relief, one of the largest there's Samaritan's Purse that's run by US. Billy Graham's son, Franklin. These and other efforts have led there's World New York Vision. Times columnist Nicholas it's largely Christoph evangelical to run. label America's evangelicals the new international. A lot of the denominations in pour millions Christoph of dollars. Wrote, Evangelicals Into are world usually relief. regarded by snooty, college-educated, by coastal elites as dangerous Neanderthals. The issue is, though, when you look at but while the, the social justice right issues, we don't align ourselves up with the, the same agenda the as the far left. And Hillary and Clinton represented the far left. And the Democratic Party Yet represents the today, far left. And the problem is that we are being blamed for not right. being social conscious when, in fact, Christians are still socially conscious. Cares. But they don't the want to see gay marriage. They don't want to see abortion continue. And there's a Rather whole long list of things secularization of the public schools where we bring students in there as christian children and they come out secular monsters that shoot up schools and do all kinds of things so the issue is not one of activism it's one of values we don't want the values of the far left progressives we didn't want the values of hillary clinton and this that's why evangelicals overwhelmingly rejected Hillary Clinton. And the Luther only other way they could vote ABCs was Donald Trump. And so they went to the polls. They didn't like what they saw in his Luther character. They didn't like what they saw the in Catholic his lifestyle. In they didn't like the all this other stuff. But he did promise them change on abortion. And he promised them a number of things that made us vote for him Luther rather than Hillary Clinton. It's that simple. And I don't understand time, why people like Caitlin Beatty um, are so flummoxed by why evangelicals went with Trump. It's the only the Bible, alternative the they had. The and if we had to do it over again, I'm sure... The same percentage of evangelicals would vote for Trump again because he's pretty much given us what he promised he would so far. He's tried, and we pretty much got what he promised and said he would do. So as far as being satisfied, I would say Christians are, for the most part, satisfied in the vote they cast for Donald Trump. Well, thanks a lot. We'll talk to you again next week on another edition of Christ and Culture. God bless.